very interesting essay. Ki Harim Yamushu. Why does he talk about this here? Because this is uh, from this week's uh, Haftara. It's a, where is it? It's in Isaiah 54. And the second to last verse is about, is the verse that he's now going to quote. And so to understand this whole Haftara and how is it related to the end of the year? Why was it put here? Why, why did the sages say to read this? So I should really read it, a little bit of it to you in English. Isaiah 54. And at first it's, it's hard to understand what in the world Isaiah is saying. What does he want from us? How is it related to the end of the year? A lot of questions that come up. So let me read it. This part of it. So it starts, like you said, Aniyasuara. Aniyasuara, how did they translate it here? Say, um, O afflicted storm, O afflicted storm tossed one. Okay. One who has not been consoled. So we're still in the seven weeks of consolation. So it's related to, the, to those consolations, but it's got a lot to do with the end of the year also. Behold, I will lay gems as your flooring stones and lay your foundation with sapphires. I will set your window frames with ruby and make you gates of carbon, carbuncle stones and your entire boundary will be of precious stones. All your children will be students of Hashem and your children's peace will be abundant. Establish yourself through righteousness, dis distance yourself from oppression, for you need not fear it, and from devastation, for it will not come near you. Behold, they may indeed gather together, but it is without my consent. Whoever will gather against you will fall because of you. Behold, I created the smith who fans his charcoal flame and withdraws a tool for his labor, but, but I have also created the destroyer to demolish. Any weapon sharpened against you will not succeed, and any tongue that will rise against you in judgment you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of Hashem, and the righteousness from me, the word of Hashem. Sounds like a little of predictions. So that is the wrong one. That's Ray. I started too late. It's earlier in chapter 54. It's Rani Akara. It's not Ani Asola, sorry. So it was very nice uh, verses. And it's also related to the end of the year. It was two weeks ago, but it's not this week's uh, Haftara. So this one is a, little, is a little bit different. It's sing out, O barren one, who has not given birth. Break into glad song and be jubilant. You have not been in birth travail. For the children of the desolate, meaning Jerusalem, will outnumber the children of the inhabited one, says Hashem. Broaden the place of your tent and let the curtains of your dwelling stretch out. Stint not, lengthen your cords and strengthen your pegs. For you will burst out to the right and to the left. Your offspring will inherit nations and they will settle desolate cities. We talked about that on, on our trip now. When he says you're going to inherit nations, he doesn't mean that you're going to conquer the earth. He means that your ideas, the way that you understand God, the way that you uh, relate to one another, the way that you live, that will conquer the world. That will be exported everywhere. Fear not, for you will not be shamed. Do not feel humiliated, humiliated, for you will not be disgraced, for you will forget the shame of your youth, and you will no longer recall the disgrace of your widowhood. So your youth, you could say, was before the destruction of the temple. And what did the Jewish people do then? So they're very involved in a certain sense in, in figuring themselves out, like a teenager. Um, and like teenagers, they do stupid things, you know, they uh, uh, drive drunk and they do this and they do that, and in the end they crashed the car. And uh, they became a widow. <laughs> and the temple was destroyed. And it's like, it's like any nation growing up, it goes through a long process of, of, of uh, adolescence until it becomes 
but then when you suddenly grow up because you become a widow, and suddenly you're, you're faced with the real facts of life. And that's sort of what happened to the Jewish people in the exile after the temple was destroyed. Suddenly we understood that um, the world is not as, uh, as easy as we thought it was. Life is not as easy as we thought it was. When we came out of Egypt, we thought it was all, you know, all hunky-dory. It's all very easy. Because you've got these prophets, and they tell you what to do. But there was no serious, intense thought about how do we survive uh, on our own merits, okay? on, on something that's, that's, that's deeper than just uh, Hashem uh, saving you at every moment. Okay? So what happened after the temple was destroyed? Suddenly we figured out that wait, it depends on us. So what do we start doing? What we started doing was creating the, the, the oral tradition. We started saying, look, this thing that we received at Sinai, it's a blueprint for creation. What do we mean by a blueprint for creation? This is how the world is going to solve its problems. It's through this word of God. And we need to start figuring out, figuring out a language to share it with people. So the first thing that they did was they created the, the call it the, uh, the dialectic uh, mode of, of, of advancing thought, not the Socratic method. That, that was going nowhere. That, that, that solved maybe a few problems, but it wasn't deep enough and it wasn't inspired enough. And it wasn't enough people. It wasn't, you, you have to have a whole nation that's, that's involved in these things. So when they created this in the second temple, it suddenly became the way that everybody does scholarship. Everybody in the world, after they saw the Talmud, everybody learned Talmudic dialect. So it didn't fit everybody because not everybody had a holy text. But it fit for a long time because people had Christianity, they had Islam, they did. You know, for a long time Islam made a lot of, a lot of progress in human thought because they were using the same, the same methods that they learned from the sages. And the, the, the Christians were also doing the same thing. But somewhere along the, uh, along the way, they got stuck. Why did they get stuck? Because they didn't really have an inspired text. They, had, they didn't have a word of God. They had something that you know, some very nice people wrote down, which was a, a mimicry of, of what the Torah says, but they didn't have the Torah itself. So at some, so at some level, it broke down. Okay. At some level, it broke down. So... You have to figure this out. You have to figure out what what, do you, what kind of language do you build in order to solve the world's problems. And and I think that's that's what he means here, that you suddenly go out into the world and and you're a widow now, but you still have to fend for yourself. You still have to make you know make a living. And the Jewish people began to figure out that you know the only way the only thing we really have to sell in the end is the Torah, and not to sell it. We're not really selling it, but we're 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 marketing it. This is the way to solve problems. For your master is your maker, Hashem, master of legions is his name. Your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, God of all the world, will he be called? For like a wife who had been forsaken in melancholy, has Hashem called upon you. And like a wife of one's youth who has, been, who has become despised, said your God, for but a brief moment have I forsaken you, and with abundant mercy will I gather you. With a slight wrath, have I concealed my countenance from you for a moment, but with eternal kindness shall I show you mercy, said your Redeemer Hashem. He says, you're in the best possible position because now that I've thrown you out of your house, you're a widow, you're, you're without support, and you've had to learn how to tap into the Torah and bring out the wisdom that it has in it, you're in a much better position than, than you were. And I'm telling you that you will discover me through, through what you're going to do. You will discover me. And then he, he says something amazing. He says, suddenly, what's the connection? This is where it becomes, this, this is really what the Alter Rebbe is now quoting. For like the waters of Noah shall, be, shall this be to me. Just as I swore that the waters of Noah would never again pass over the earth, so have I sworn not to be wrathful, wrathful with you, nor to rebuke you. So, so much I can understand. He's saying, look, when the, the, the flood came, it had to come. There were good reasons for it. But then I swore I would never do it again this way. He's saying to us, look, don't be afraid anymore. I'm not going to destroy the temple again the same way. It's kind of strange because we, right, Isaiah is saying this. We know that another temple was destroyed. But, but our understanding is that the second temple wasn't really a, wasn't really a temple. 
we know that it wasn't really a temple. It was missing the main ingredients. Okay? The most important ingredient, the ark, wasn't there. So what was it? There was the service. You could, sell, you could say that the social aspect existed. The service brought people together. It made them into a nation. That's a very important thing. But it didn't have the inspiration that the first temple did. It, it, it lacked the source of godliness, which is the ark and the tablets and the Torah that's inside. So the second temple is not really considered to be um, another attempt that failed. It's considered to be a continuation of the, of the first attempt. It wasn't made any different. It, it, it was all built on the same premise. So I understand, I can understand what he's saying now. He's saying, don't be afraid to try again, because I promise you that I will never be wrathful the same way. Okay. And it was very wrathful. One might say, again, it's not, I don't have an easy answer to it. You know, a, lot, a lot of thinkers have tried, have, have tried to give something along the lines I just said, that when you look at the second temple, you have to say that it was really just a parenthesis. It wasn't um, a real, there was no real autonomy ever. There was a very short period of 35 years where, there, where, where they had autonomy. But they didn't really have autonomy. So they were always under somebody else. They were always in Midbar Amim, as it's called. They were always under the what the what the what the Rambam calls Shiabud Malchuyot. They were always subject to some empire. They weren't really free to act um, the way that they thought they should. I mean, the Jewish people in, in the land of Israel uh, during the Second Temple period. <clears throat> in that sense, it's not it's not a second kingdom. Never really, there wasn't never until now a second kingdom. Okay? Now there is a second kingdom. The question is, what is this kingdom about, right? If you're going to make an Israeli state and all that interests it is to be uh, militarily strong, and in Senate it gives the good excuse, like we have no other choice, uh, okay, maybe. It wants to be economically strong, uh, okay. But Everybody understands that at the heart of what we call the state of Israel, there's not the Torah. The Torah is not there. So though there is a kingdom now, there's an autonomous, as it were, kingdom to some extent, uh, it really doesn't serve the purpose yet. Under the rule of America. And it's still, there's still Shiabud Malchuyot to, to a great degree. It's still under the rule of other empires still. So the autonomy is not full, but certainly the direction is not autonomous. It's not, it's not looking to really influence the world except by some mimicry of this thing called startups, and then you become a startup nation. I mean, it's nonsense, really, because that's not what the Torah has to offer. The Torah has a lot more than that to offer. And that, startups were invented in America, and technology was invented in America. So if all you're doing is you're just doing what America does, okay, so we understand. You're, you're, you're a protectorate of the United States. If it, a complete pot. If, it's, yeah, yeah. if you look at the Pfizer vaccine, you might come to the conclusion, yeah, that's true. Why? Because in the United States, the FDA has not yet approved a third shot. But in Israel, already a million people have received it. So how did that happen? Because they said, yeah, well, why, why should we be idiots and approve a shot without any data? These guys are willing to take the shot, and we'll see the data, and we'll, then we'll decide. So it's, it's even worse than that in, in some ways. It's sort of, it's it's like, gigantic clinical okay. trial. Yeah. That's not very good for influencing. That's not very good for being autonomous. But then he says something that is an allusion to the flood, but it, it doesn't make real sense in the beginning. So he says, and this is the verse that the Altar Rebbe is going to start with, For the mountains may be moved, and the hills may falter, but my kindness shall not be removed from you, and my covenant of peace shall not falter, says the one who shows you mercy, Hashem. So, there's a word missing here in the translation. I don't know why they... Uh, um, oh, no, he says, that my covenant of peace. He mentioned covenant. So now the Altar Rebbe is going to explain this. And what, what does this have to do with the flood? What does this have... Why is this the illusion 
of what it means to restart um, the Jewish people, as it were, the autonomous people, which is what Isaiah is basically prophesizing. He's prophesizing that there's going to come a time when all my anger at you, everything that you know you did wrong that caused you to go uh, become a widow, basically, to be thrown out of God's house, all of that will end, and you'll come back. And at that time, he's telling us something strange. He's saying, think of the, of, of the flood. That's the image I want you to think of. Plus, something that happened in the flood... <coughs> What happened in the flood? That the mountains were covered. Remember? It says, mm-hmm. that 15 cubits higher than the highest mountains, the waters covered the face of the earth. So what happened during the flood? Did, did, the, did the mountains uh, fall? Did they move? Did they falter? No. Not clear. When you say that they were covered, you're saying that they too were included in the flood. At least the, you know, when you contest geological thinking, <laughs> the Torah's uh, version of history with geological history. So one of the answers that people give is that the flood changed everything. So that what you see today is nothing like the pre- deluge earth. It was different, entirely different. Because many things were different. We know one of the things we've talked about before is that we say that there was no rainbow. How could there not be a rainbow? Because there was too much sediment, in the, there was too much uh, uh, fog, or there was, uh, there was something going on in the atmosphere that didn't allow condensation so that clouds could become well-defined. Well, there's different opinions, which is there were rainbows, but the ocean dedicated to... Can but we, but we saw the Alter Rebbe's essay on this. We saw it a year ago in Parshas Noach. We, we learned it from the, from the Mimer. So you remember what we did there, what we saw there. That the Alter Rebbe says, no, it's not that it was dedicated. That's, that's an, another opinion. Is that the actual earth changed. The atmosphere changed after the flood. And it allowed uh, clouds to form. And the moment that it allowed clouds to form, you could see Chesed through Din. That, that was the idea that he gave there. That the light going through the clouds and breaking up and becoming a rainbow, that is God's mercy showing through the water. Water is a symbol, in this case, or the, the, the rainwater is a, a symbol of Gvura. There was no rainfall before the time of God. There was rainfall, but there was no break in the cloud cover. You can't have a rainbow if there's no break in the clouds. It was permanently cloudy. So? It was permanently cloudy. Permanently cloudy. It's like London. <laughs> it's like England. Everything was England. Why? Well, what, did the, what did the flood change again? We don't know exactly, but it, it changed. So you might say that geologically, the earth that we see after the flood is different. It's a different earth. Today, when they, they, they talk about if there would be a catastrophe caused by something. Like, for instance, if, if, a, you know, if the sages say that what happened, they say that it was a, an asteroid that struck the Earth. They say that very clearly. Right? It says in the Gemara. What happened, how did the flood come about? An asteroid hit the Earth. In Brachos, at the end of Brachos. Yeah. Yeah? It says that God took a star from Kima. Where's Kima? So Kima is a, is a name for many objects in the sky. One of the objects that it is is, is, is a galaxy. They call it the Palisades or something like that. It's a group, a cluster of galaxies. But there's another Kima, which is much closer. And the Kima that apparently they mean is the asteroid belt. Which one? There's three asteroid belts around uh, the sun. So most... Um, most chances are it's not from the near astro- asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. It's from the asteroid belt that's outside <clears throat> Neptune. And that, for instance, Pluto is one of the uh, bigger things there. It's an ice planet. So most of the objects, in, I think it's called the Kuiper belt. I don't remember what it's called. 
Um, there's the Oort belt, which is really far away. It's the edges of the solar system. It's like 50 astronomical units out. It's very far, 50,000 astronomical units out. There's the Kuiper belt. And the Kuiper belt is, is from Neptune out to, I don't know, like twice the distance from, uh, after, from the sun to Neptune. It's very big. So one of those objects came and hit the Earth. That, everybody knows today, or at least everybody knows, everybody who deals with this uh, argues that if an object that was big enough hit the Earth, um, you, you would get tectonic shifts that would change the, whole, the, the way the whole planet uh, looked. So things that you may think are in geological age, you know, 50 million years old, or 100 million years old, or a billion years old, may actually really be only 3,000 years old. It depends if, you, if there was such a catastrophic hit and exactly what happened uh, following that. Okay. Anyway, uh, there's all kinds of theories that you could, you could build. Time, what? It was before my time. Was it wasn't so much before my time. <laughs> In any case, so, so, so we've, we've got this question about the mountains and, and the hills that were covered by the floodwaters and, and how that exactly affected them. Said, uh, that, I, I want to put that aside because we're not going to deal with the, with the geological questions. What we want to really deal with is, and that's what the Alter Rebbe is going to do, is what, what does this symbolically mean? What, what is Isaiah talking about? How do you unravel this symbol? What does it really mean? What does he want to say? He's got this picture, again, that don't worry because after the flood I promise there wouldn't be another flood. The same thing, I want you to act now in such a way, he's telling the Jewish people, I want you to act in such a way that you can, you're guaranteed that whatever you build now will last. But I also want you to know one more thing, that even if the mountains falter and the hills are, 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 are swept away, okay, my kindness shall not be removed from you and my covenant of peace shall not falter. Well, what's going on? What does he want? Who, what, what, what are you talking about? What, what are these mountains and hills? And why does your kindness and your covenant of peace come to replace them? Okay. And I'm the one who shows you mercy, says Hashem. Okay? So that, that's, these are the images that the Altar Rebbe now wants to explain. So again, yamushu, The mountains will move. Mutena, the hills will fall. But my kindness to you will not falter. And my covenant of peace will not falter. Says Hashem who shows you mercy. So says the Altar Rebbe, We know that the symbol, the image of mountains relates to the patriarchs. It's like a pasuk in Micah, there's many psukim that we see throughout the prophets that whenever they talk about the mountains, they're talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're called the mountains. What's the idea? Why do we call the patriarchs mountains? He says, because what does a mountain do? What, is, what does a mountain represent? Look at a mountain in the physical sense. In, in theory, the, the earth is like, is like the ocean. It should be a, a round, perfect sphere. But then suddenly you get a mountain. And the mountain comes and says, it's not flat anymore. It suddenly rises up. So the earth the is, the everything is the same. And then suddenly you have a mountain. And so, the the sea. What do you mean? In the, can't come but they're covered. You don't see them. We're talking about the mountains that you see. And from this straight circumference of, not circumference, but the straight spheroid of the earth, right? It's all flat, as a worth in theory. Suddenly you get a mountain. So what does the mountain represent? It suddenly reaches out to the sky. It says, look, the, the, the world is flat. Flat means... Everybody's the same. Everybody's the same. Everybody's regular. People live. They're born. They live. They die. What do they do in their lives? They eat some. They go to the bathroom some. They wash some. They have more children. And they die. What do they do? 
What's their recollection? Nothing. Why? Because they didn't do anything extraordinary. It says the patriarchs are called mountains because they stick out. Good? They're not flat. They're not like everything else, right? Whenever you, we talk about circles in Kabbalah and Hasidus, what are we talking about? Sobev kol admin. The light that circle, and surrounds everything, right? That light is equanimous. It, 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 it's, it's equal to everybody. It treats everybody the same. Everybody has a body. Everybody's body is sustained by God in the same way. Whatever drugs work on Jews, they work on everybody else. There's no difference between all the bodies. They're all the same. Okay. That's called so good. The, the Avo suddenly brought in, the patriarch suddenly brought in what we call God's light that fills all worlds. They suddenly integrated godliness into the human being. And suddenly the human being became something more than just another animal walking around, and all, all, the, all the members of the species are the same. So, so these, these men, they're called mountains because they stick out. There's suddenly a line, there's suddenly a, a projection protruding from the equality that everybody's in, and suddenly something special. That's why they're called mountains. It says these are the, the great mountains under the under the entire under the heavens. the patriarchs too, and Harim Israel, Aglai. He says it's even more than that. Even when you're talking about Jews, Knesset Israel, the congregation of Israel, do we know everybody's name? Who lived a hundred, two hundred, a thousand years ago? We know nobody's name. Patriarchs means that there were some people who did something special. And so they elevate, they lift the entire congregation of Israel. They turn it into something that's abnormal, something that's worthy of note. You, you can look at it and say, this is something special. They are the ones who elevate the entire people. So that's what they're called mountains. Because instead of everything being flat, suddenly you have a mountain. Uh, <laughs> Stanza has told me once, what is the purpose of the Everest? So people keep climbing. Yeah, if you're English, that's what it means, right? If you're, what's his name? Or, uh, Sir Hillary. It doesn't matter, it's all the same problem. What's the purpose of the Everest? The purpose of the Everest is to remind you that there are giants in the world. Not everything is the hills of Yerushalayim. <laughs> okay. Hills of Yerushalayim, okay, they're very interesting, 700 meters, 800 meters, very nice. You know what? We were just in Austria. Alps are very, very impressive. But as high as they go, they only go not even to half the height of the Everest. So I can't even imagine what it's like to look at that. Now you, now you have to imagine that about people. There are people, and most people are run-of-the-mill. They're very holy, they're very good, every, everything's fine. They do what they're supposed to do. But what are they in the end? <laughs> they're the hills of Yerushalayim. Once in a while there's an Everest. The Rebbe was an Everest. Once in a while you get somebody who everybody looks at and he can't miss it. He sticks out. He's like a mountain. But he doesn't just stick out. When there's an Everest, there's a Himalayan mountain range around it. Even when there's an Ararat, even when there's a Chermon, even when there's an, I don't know, uh, a mountain in the Alps, it doesn't leave the rest of the ground around it flat. It lifts everything with it. So around it, you'll get, right, you'll get the Everest at 8,800 or whatever it is, and 8,700 meters. And right next to it, there's another mountain at 8,200. And right next to it, there's another one, 7,000. And, and of the 13 peaks, I think, in the world that are above 8,000 meters, they're all next to the Everest. Yeah. They're all in the Himalayas. There's not, nowhere else. But it's the same thing everywhere. Wherever you get this tremendous mountain, you'll find that that mountain raises other pieces of land next to it. So when you get somebody like the Rebbe, 
So you get people around him who are giants also. They're not like him exactly, but they're pretty big. You get Rabbi Sachs, who's probably the most celebrated rabbi in the world, more than the Rebbe. You get Rav Steinzeltz. These people gravitate towards him. But it's not just that they gravitate towards him. They have potential. But he lifts them. He turns them into something. So every time there's a, a, there's a patriarch, every time there's... And patriarchs are not just Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. It's true that it's Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Only, only Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov elevate everybody. The Rebbe didn't elevate everybody. The, the, the Rav Avadi didn't elevate. He, he elevated himself. So if the Rebbe was 8,800 meters... Was Rav Avadia 6,000? Was he 5,000, 4,000? I don't know. I don't know how to measure it. But he wasn't elevated because of... He's like an Ararat. He's somewhere else. Okay? But the patriarchs, they elevated everybody. They took everybody up. They took the whole congregation of Israel. Every single Jew who's ever born, he's at a different level because of what Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov did. Without the Torah. They even did it without the Torah. They did it just because of themselves. So only they, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, are the ones who elevate everybody. It is through them, through their love, awe, and compassion, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, that every single Jew is elevated for time forever. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't elevate everybody? No, nope, he's not enough. He gave us the Torah, but he didn't elevate us as people. Nobody is inspired by Moshe Rabbeinu. Nobody is. We don't know where he's buried even. What is Moshe? Moshe is a conduit. Moshe is part of Hashem. He's more part of Hashem than he is part of us. <laughs> we don't know what this man is. He didn't live a human life. He was a human. Of course he was. But he didn't live like a human. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't have a wife. He, did, he had to leave his wife. It's not normal. The, the Avos never left their wives. The patriarchs never left their wives. That's why you get patriarchs and matriarchs. Because they had wives. Yes. Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't give birth to a nation. They do. So there's something about them that is ingrained in every single Jew. So it's true that every Jew also has an aspect of Moshe Rabbeinu. But that's our aspect of Bittl. That's our ability to nullify before Hashem. Here we're not talking about the ability to nullify before Hashem. We're talking about the ability to live a superhuman life. Not to stop living as a human. But rather to live as a human but on a whole different level. Um, maybe you have to take oxygen when it's that high. <coughs> you have to take oxygen with you. But in the end, it's a whole different level. Look, Moshe Katuv, and he gives now an explanation, I, I mean, we're going to skip it. Vinamu Razal. So, so this will have to continue tomorrow because our time is up. Okay, so this is what he's going to deal with. That Isaiah says that if the mountains move, you can't count on the patriarchs anymore to elevate you. And the hills will falter. My kindness and my covenant of peace will not, says Hashem. Meaning, he's telling us there's going to come a time where you're going to have to elevate yourselves based on something else. What else is there? Ah, so that's what he says. My kindness and my covenant of peace. So we're going to have to understand what those are. That's what this essay is going to be about. And I, that's why I call this you're all out of love. Which love? The love that you received from the patriarchs. So we know, we already know, right? Because the love that we received from the patriarchs, what's that called? Mm-hmm. It's called the natural love. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to come to a higher level of connection with Hashem that is not natural. It's not ingrained within you. It's going to have to come from a higher level. And that we'll see in the rest of the week, Ms. Atashem.